Hi everyone, this is part two of our discussion with David Osborne. It picks up right where we left off in part one. Welcome back. So let's talk about a couple of these other cities, because although you focus on these three in particular, and you mentioned Indianapolis, um, it's not like this is a localized situation. It's spreading. Camden, um, New Jersey is a very ex uh, interesting example. Newark, other places. Any other cities worth mentioning? Memphis. So talk about Memphis, because so they had uh, an intervention called the Achievement School District in Tennessee. Uh, the state decided that they wanted to take over some persistently failing schools, and they decided, well, let's use a charter-like model, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Memphis has four sectors of public education. Um, and this is worth pausing on because uh, a lot of us, we used to think of public education as a sector. It's the government, it's a school board, it runs all schools. What else is there? But now, because of this, we see their schools run by nonprofits, overseen by the state, overseen by the district, run by the district, but with more autonomy. Yeah. It's a diversification within the species of public education. It is, absolutely. So they have the traditional schools. And then for years, they've been authorizing charters. So there are about 45 charter schools authorized by, sh by the school district, Shelby County School District. Mm -hmm. um, and they are pretty, they perform pretty well, um, better than the district schools. Uh, then the state passed, the, created the Achievement School District, modeled on Louisiana's Recovery School District, which made, which made this happen in New Orleans, mm -hmm. to take over the worst schools in the state, hand them mostly to charter operators, and they would try to turn them around. They would stay neighborhood schools, which is a difference from most charters. Uh, so there are, in Memphis, around, I um, think, about 29 of those schools. And um, I think they're now all charters. And then in that same bill, the legislature gave the district the power to create its own innovation zone for its worst schools. It's, this is a way to kind of play defense. Uh -huh. Rather than having your schools taken away, you can create an innovation zone. You can give those schools a lot of autonomy and some extra money. Um, and see how that goes. And so they have 21 of those, which are doing pretty well. So it's a really interesting mixture. And the folks there are, yesterday were in Indianapolis, where I was yesterday. Um, the superintendent and some of the school board were there learning about the Innovation Network schools in Indianapolis. Because with this innovation zone, they've got this question, well, what do we, they, we do when they graduate? You know, when they, they're no longer poorly performing, they get above average, what do we do? We don't want to take autonomy away from them. Um, and so they're quite interested in what's going on in Indianapolis. Okay, so let's talk about what I think is one of the most interesting and maybe fairest critiques of this new model, uh, chartering or what you call the 21st century approach to school delivery and governance, which is some people will say it's taking the public out of public education, namely the democratic control. One of the virtues people would say of the traditional way of doing it is every community, every city has a locally elected school board, so the voters get to decide who's gonna be on the board, and then that board, using the public will, dem democratic legitimacy behind it, decides the contours of the system. This new model, it's a little less clear how democracy plays a role, or it can be, because if there's a statewide entity that authorizes charter schools, you have a faraway state body and then these local nonprofits that are running a whole bunch of schools. So people say, um, where's democratic control? Where's the right of the voter? So how do you respond to them? Well, I think we, we need to maintain democratic control. Um, and there are states that have given nonprofits uh, the right, for example, to authorize charters. Mm -hmm. I think that's a mistake. Like, for example, in Ohio, um, mm -hmm. there were some nonprofits that could authorize schools. Right. And it's a mistake because some of them didn't do such a hot job, right? Yeah, absolutely. Minnesota also. Louisiana has done it. I don't know if any have authorized yet, but the law passed. I, I think it was a big mistake. We do need democratic accountability. Mm -hmm. So in the cities I'm writing about, you actually have strong steering, which is, and the steerers are democratically accountable. In New Orleans, you've got the traditional school board with an elected board, mm -hmm. uh, traditional school district with an elected board, and then you had the recovery school district, which reported to an elected and appointed state board. Mm -hmm. But 
The reformers always intended those schools, once they've been turned around, to go back to the district. And next July 1st, unless there's a fly in the ointment, in which case it'll be a year later, all those schools will go back to the locally elected school board. So you will have, just like before this happened, and a locally elected school board that's in charge of all the public schools in New Orleans. Only they'll all be operated by nonprofits. So this is such an important point that I think we need to put a fine point on, which is in New Orleans, as of next year, if everything goes according to Hoyle, 100% of schools will be run by nonprofits, but 100% of these public schools will be overseen by a locally elected local school board. And, and that board, I would argue, will have more control than under the old model. In the old model, they because were running all the schools. Now they they're overseeing were, them. But they were so politically constrained. And they had teacher tenure for everybody. And there were so many things they couldn't do, mm -hmm. either because of the rules, which were a lot of rules, or because of politics, because they couldn't afford to alienate enough, alienate too many of the people who worked for them. In this new model, they don't have those, all those rules and they don't have all those constraints. If they want to close a school, it's easy. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wouldn't say easy. It's easier. far easier. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been happening. You know, they do. Um, and they replace them with better schools. And they figured out how to go to the parents and show them, look, this school is failing. But here are three options of schools models we could put in there. Which, what would you like best? Right. So, Anyway, I think they have more control, real control, over, particularly over the outcomes for the kids. Okay. Now, I just wanted to point out, in these other cities, in Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. there is no school board anymore, elected school board anymore. It was so bad that the mayor convinced the city council to do away with it. So the, dis the traditional district has a chancellor appointed by the mayor. Mm -hmm. The charter board, which oversees 120 charters, mm -hmm. is appointed by the mayor. Same democratic accountability. Yep. In Denver, the elected school board is the authorizer, democratically accountable. Indianapolis, the elected school board and the mayor are both author authorizers now, both elected. So I think this argument is right. We do, we do want some democratic accountability in the system. Um, but uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but democratic accountability doesn't necessarily mean that the d democratic board and a government bureaucracy has to run all the schools. They can oversee them. They can do the, in fact, the steering. In fact, I think we have more accountability if they don't run them. That's right. It's far easier to close an institution when it's not your employees. So let's just um, spend one more minute, if you don't mind, on the results, because critics of this will say, yeah. well, what this is, is this is a privatization scheme. This is just a way to take um, schools away from uh, the government, uh, empower nonprofits or private organizations. Your book is very clear that it's not just that this is a system change, this is an improvement for lots, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of low-income kids, yep. that in these cases, um, whether it's test scores or graduation rates, things are better off than they were a decade ago. So if you don't mind, what are the things that popped, uh, as you're doing your research, the most impressive results that should convince people that this isn't just a good idea, it's good in practice? So New Orleans is the fastest improving city in the country. And it's- A post-Katrina we're talking about. Yes. And it could be the fastest improving in American history. I mean, no way to tell, but some people think that. Mm -hmm. um, this is a city with 85% of the kids qualify for subsidized meals, meaning they're low income. Mm -hmm. Very poor city. 82% are African American. Mm -hmm. And this city outperforms its state on the two most important things that the state measures, high school graduation and college going rates. There is no other city in America where that's the case with those demographics and it outperforms the state. Now, it used to be one of the worst in the country. So we have seen just a radical change. It is far more effective. Um, well, Washington, D.C., if people say, well, about 50% of kids are in the district, 50% are in the charter sector, how do we know the charter sector is better? Well, um, if you compare the same kids demographically mm -hmm. on test scores, the charter sector is better. If you compare attendance rates, the charter sector is better. If you compare college going rates, graduation rates, the charter sector is better. And I want to give credit to the district. Mm -hmm. They've improved mm -hmm. enormously. They are the fastest improving district of 21 large districts that take the national assessment of educational progress, the one national test. Mm -hmm. So hats off to them. 
But as you know, and you've written about, um, if you look at the low income kids in, in DC and the African American kids, it's a totally different picture. If you go to the poorest wards, seven and eight in DC, and just look at test scores, charters compared to DCPS, district operated schools, dramatic difference. The charters just vastly outperform them. Denver, um, when they started this, 39% of the kids graduated in four years. Hmm. Now it's about 70%. Um, they went from the slowest improving district of Colorado's 20 largest to the fastest. Um, and before, before they shifted to a common core line test in 2015, the park test, they were typically, their schools were around the 15th to the 20th percentile statewide, meaning their average, 80% of the schools in the state outperformed their average. When they went to the park test, which is more demanding and on which low income kids usually do worse, they went into the 40s for elementary and the 50s for middle school. Phenomenal. It is. You, you, you can't argue with these results. This is what we want for all children, isn't it? Uh, I would hope so, <laughs> <laughs> certainly. Well, let's end on another positive note here because I think a lot of people who talk about, write about um, education, it seems like they're always bad news stories. Um, let me ask it this way. 30 years ago, it was the case in virtually every big city in America that 100% of kids in public schools were educated by the traditional district. That is changing, and we're seeing, as you said, some really good results in this new model. Fast forward us 30 years from now. What do you think public education delivery is going to look like and operations um, in the average big American city? I think it's going to look like New Orleans. I think it's going to be all, almost all the schools in most cities, big cities, are going to be operated by independent organizations. Most of those will be nonprofits. And they won't all be called charters. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll be called innovation schools and renaissance schools and partnership schools and, and other things. But this new model will have taken hold. And I expect to, it to be taking hold in, in the larger suburbs as well. Um, Interesting. Not sure if it'll ever get to rural America because there are elements of it uh, that probably won't fly there. Hard to have a lot of choice in rural America, right? geographically, right. it's just hard. And, you know, I spent 25 years in this town of 3,000 people in Massachusetts. And in a town like that, everything's personal relationships. Mm -hmm. So I just have a hard time imagining that in that town, somebody's gonna tell all the teachers that, oh, I'm sorry, you're not doing a good enough job, we're gonna contract with this other operator to run the school, bye. It's just, so I, I'm not gonna make any predictions about rural America. Right. But I, I think it'll be the norm in urban America and becoming the norm in suburban America. That's pretty profound. We ran um, public education and governed it in America's cities just about the exact same way in just about every city for more than a century. And what you're telling us is that over the course of maybe two generations, it's going to flip. Yeah. The government will be in a completely different role. Nonprofit civil society will have a bigger role. And hopefully we're going to see these results continue to spread across America. Better results for America's low income kids. Yeah. Pretty exciting, right? Yeah. And one reason I believe it is because it's happened before. In the agricultural era, in the 1800s, we were mostly a nation of one-room schoolhouses. Mm -hmm. And then the industrial era was born. In the 1890s, a lot of cities tripled in population. It was an explosion, yeah. right? And what we had wasn't good enough. So business leaders and progressive political leaders and civic leaders spent a long time reinventing public education. They created the districts that are now out of date because we're no longer in the industrial era. And they embraced the cutting edge corporate model of the day, which was called bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was a good term at the time. It was. It was, there's a famous quote from Max Weber, the German sociologist, something to the effect that bureaucracy is the most perfect form of organization available to mankind. It seemed neat and tidy and efficient. Um, it was completely sensible. A yeah. hundred years later, we realized that maybe families deserve more choice, more options actually make sense. Well, also conditions change so much. Um, you know, back then they had to get people educated to a point where they'd be good factory workers, mm -hmm. a lot of people, right? A high school degree was a ticket to the middle class when I went to high school. Mm -hmm. um, 
that's all changed. Plus, we have technology, you know. We have the most wonderful teaching tools ever. Computers, the internet. So the opportunities are vast. But if you have a system that's built to be stable and rigid, it's really hard to take, take advantage of those opportunities. Um, and we've had a huge wave of immigration over the last 25 years, and, and now the majority of kids in our public schools in this country are pe children of color. Mm -hmm. That's a big change. Um, and, you know, when I was growing up, we had a growing middle class, and now we have growing inequality. So poverty is much more concentrated and a bigger problem than it was. And our schools need to deal with it. So it's not that, you know, I always say that we have great people in the public education system working really hard, but they're trapped in an obsolete system and we need to liberate them to give them a system that will deal with today's realities rather than the realities of 100 years ago. And what we have now, in your, thanks to your book, um, it's not just ideas, it's happening in city after city and getting great results. A great note to end on. David Osborne, author of uh, Reinventing America's Schools, thank you. Oh, thank you, it's been a pleasure. Hi everyone, that's the end of our discussion with David Osborne. Thanks so much for watching. As always, let us know what other topics you'd like AEI scholars to cover on Viewpoint. And to learn more about school choice, charter schools, and other topics the AEI team is working on, check out the links in the description below, including my review of David's excellent book.